Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's my favourite stage of all, the fireside stage. It's kind of cosy, huh? It's beautiful, isn't it? It just makes me feel like uh, I've finally arrived in Helsinki when I see this in front of me. <laughs> um, it's uh, amazing to be here. I I'd love to, just for the first couple of minutes, uh, let Stephanie and James really tell you a little bit more about what they do so that you've got a better understanding of that. And then we'll, uh, we'll start digging into the questions. And speaking of questions, make sure that you have the Slido app open. I'm hoping that this session in particular is going to cause quite a few interesting questions, so we're going to look forward to that. Um, Stephanie, tell everybody what, uh, what you do. Sure. So um, I'm Stephanie Elias. I'm a co-founder of Mystery Vibe. We design, develop, manufacture, and sell luxury pleasure products, so smart vibrators. Um, so yeah, and I also, um, I consider myself a sex futurist. I do a lot of research into what's going to happen in the future when it comes to sex, technology and intimacy. And I also host a podcast called The Curious Nature of Sex, where we talk about all kinds of topics, including sex robots. Fantastic. And uh, James, why don't you tell everybody about yourself? Yeah, I basically have begun a journey of exploring my personal potential uh, physical relationship with technology in the future in terms of kind of augmenting my body with this kind of canvas I have from my missing limbs. Um, and that led me to be in contact with the BBC. And since I met them, I've been exploring also the kind of emotional level that humans can interact with technology. And, and that's led me to the Can Robots Love Us film. Um, and it kind of looks at the ways that uh, technology can maybe fill in the gaps in some of the ways that humans aren't providing for each other in modern society, potentially. So we explore that from like mental health to sex to companionship and stuff like that. Fantastic. I mean, let's, let's talk about that for a moment. So, you know, we're obviously at a moment in time where the technology itself has, has caught up to the point where we can now build sex robots. And we have artificially intelligent sex robot called Harmony that's just been launched. Um, inexplicably, has a Scottish accent. I can't quite figure out why. Um, it talks dirty to you in Scottish. Not, <laughs> not sure about the design decision there. Um, of course, we have other robots that are making the headlines all the time. Um, Sophia is uh, the first citizen of Saudi Arabia, uh, mm -hmm. first robot citizen. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, where are we with the technology? How much further can we go? What's possible right now and what does the future look like? It's super simple right now. Um, I don't think we'll have a fully functioning robot um, that can uh, fulfill every desire that you have for quite a long time. Um, in fact, the only thing it really hurts at the moment is your wallet because they cost a lot of money. Um, but I think in the future, it's quite interesting for me because we talk about sex robots as if that's all they're going to do. Whereas I think what will actually happen is we will build robots who can fulfill many different tasks, needs, whatever. And having sex might be just a small part of what they do. But we always focus on the sex because it's the most controversial. Uh, I don't do know what... You, do you think that's kind of a driver for the technology advancement, though? Because often we find that sex drives so much change in our society. And especially I've heard from the people that I've met in the film that there's so much money behind it. People move mm. from jobs in tech with like DeepMind and IBM and just go and work on trying to create a more advanced sex robot just oh, for the wages. Just, yeah, no, I, I kind of see it the other way around. I think porn has been very much a driver of technology in the past, but in terms of hardware, we've actually been lagging behind for a number of years. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, maybe, yeah, perhaps, but I, I feel like when we're thinking about robotics, there are so many exciting things that we can talk about, but everyone always focuses on the sex. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's quite difficult because we don't, for example, have bipedal robots already in the home assisting with, with anything. And to imagine that then we suddenly have robots that can do sexual relationships with people. It's going to take a while. Yeah, it seems crazy. I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. I mean, we've been talking about robots for a very, very long time. Uh, consumer robots that are going to help you with all of the chores in your house. I mean, I remember, you know, advertisements that uh, were shown, um, well, I don't remember them, I wasn't alive, but, you know, shown in the, uh, the 1960s. Um, and they were showing this wonderful house of the future where there are robots mm. running around all the time doing things for you. We're not even there yet. We don't even have consumer robots. So what chances are there that uh, we're going to end up with, with sex bots even in the next 20 years that are reasonable? Mm. Well, I think one of the interesting um, aspects as well is that when I say the word sex robot, I'm sure for many people sitting out in the audience, um, the thing that you picture will be a woman, 
um, probably a slim white woman, uh, because that's what media is showing us in film, across news, like for example with uh, Harmony as well. Uh, but I think when we're talking about robotics in this space, we don't have to talk about one, something that is human, to something that is gendered. There are already right. some really interesting robotics being developed that have um, I have no gender and no kind of physical form as a, as a human at all. Uh, there's one guy out of the US who's developing, for example, robots that uh, help elderly people who are alone or can like stroke you in your hospital bed when you're, when you're unwell. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I, I think another myth to bust is that sex robots are going to be A, human shaped, to gendered. Why do they need to be? Do you think, do they need to be because of our history, our evolutionary history of growing up and having sex with each other. We don't tend to have sex with other animals and creatures. But but usually. I think, <laughs> usually. We can, I think we are starting to move beyond that. I mean, if you look at the sex toy industry, for example, mm. years and years ago, if you walked into a store, all you'd be able to find are right. dildos of vibrators shaped like penises. Landscape. <laughs> Whereas now, um, actually, the majority of developments and things coming out aren't shaped like that at all. They're much more ergonomic. They're very beautiful to look at. They, you could leave them on your fireside and no one would know what they were. Or well, maybe not on the fire, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. But um, on the bedside table, and people wouldn't recognize it straight off. Uh, so I think we're kind of going beyond gender and phallic-shaped objects. Is that because those things are sex toys and they're tools? But if we mm. talk about sex robots, is it they want to kind of not just be doing this one task where they're just vibrating in a certain pattern, but they kind of we want to imbue them with qual qualities of humanity and give them kind of the ability to direct their own behavior and therefore kind of be mysterious. And in that sense, if we create a humanoid robot, do we miss out on all of the subtleties of what a human can do? And do, is that needed? Do you think that's needed? If there's a robot that we make that's like a big purple blob that has various ways to interact with you. I'm sure someone would enjoy that. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I so we like don't have to do it for everyone. Like. Everyone has different likes, different dislikes, different kinks, different fetishes. Um, so to create something that is so narrowly minded. And I think actually it's interesting uh, that when you've first said, I think one of those changes was the fact that you had more women joining the sex toy industry. And that really pushed the design of new types of products. Um, so yeah, I'd love to see more women developing robotics in this space mm. as well. Do you, in your experience, do you think it's like a narrow-minded male gaze then that we're the just moment, going, yeah, well, this is what we want, only that? At the moment, uh, at the moment, yeah. Quite Although I, I quite like the idea of a, a purple blob, um, you know, for somebody who's got a fetish for Barney the dinosaur, uh, probably <laughs> you know, very good. I'm sure there's someone out there. Uh, there must be somebody. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so talking about that interaction piece, um, big in the news for the whole of this year, every single week we've been talking about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence uh, aligned with, you know, conversational user interfaces like, uh, you know, Alexa and Siri and, and Google Assistant. Um, natural language processing, natural language understanding that understands context and can actually interact with you in, in, in a proper way. Now, you know, how is that going to impact the, the sex industry as we move towards sex robots and, and any other type of uh, sex toys in terms of providing maybe that almost human interaction that is currently being used in customer services but you know, could be adjusted and, and used for, for the sex industry, right? Do you want a vibrator that gives you pillow talk? Maybe, I don't know. Pillow maybe. Tool, maybe. <laughs> um, how's that going to work? Are we going to use AI in that way? I think it, well, it already is. I mean, the guys who are building Harmony are trying to put artificial intelligence behind her. Um, I guess some of the very interesting questions that we, that we come across, there are so many ethical questions. Uh, like, at what point do we consider some kind of robot a conscious being? At what point does it need to consent? Um, who owns the data around it? Um, or, for example, if you and a partner owned one, who owns the data if you break up? Um, there are a whole bunch of interesting questions that we could start asking um, that we're just not talking about now. Well, I don't mean now, because we're talking about it now, but society is not talking about. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, artificial intelligence will play a big role in pushing forward robotics and sex robotics. I mean, that's, that's an interesting point. Right now, we can actually customize advertisements to you based on your Fitbit public profile. Are we going to have advertisements being customized to your, uh, your sexual performance profile? 
Well, it's interesting you say that, as there's, um, in the UK, there's a bill going through Parliament called the Digital Economy Bill, and it's going to bring in something called age verification. So I think it's from April next year in the UK, if you vi visit any porn site at all, um, be it free, be it paid, you're going to have to verify your age. And the majority, well, the way they think they're going to do it at the moment is through credit card details. So you'll have to create an account with your credit card details. And it's going to give one company, which currently owns the majority of free and tube sites, a lot of information about what you're searching for, what you're watching, how long you watch it for, which bits you watch, um, even where you're from, quite specifically. So th yep. that kind of data collection is already kind of happening. Um, and we're going to have yeah. to be very, very responsible with the way that we use that data, obviously. And what happens in the UK, I think, will set a precedent, which unfortunately, um, it's not a good thing. So. But yeah. Yeah, well, how do you feel about data collection? How do you feel about AI and uh, you know, what that could mean for the future of this? Um, when I think about interacting with AI today, uh, if we can call it AI, it's kind of very, to me, frustrating and limited. Even if I go home <laughs> and ask Alexa to turn on the lights, she doesn't always get it right. So to get the level of complexity where you're actually forming companionship with a robot and having sort of I think the goal that people want is to have like a meaningful connection with these sex robots. So I don't know how long that is going to take, because that's the surrounding technologies away from sex are just not good enough. And I feel like the sex robots that we see today, it's kind of like we've seen the sign that the ball is rolling, but they kind of feel like, kind of, if you think of a, the, the ideal sex robot as being like a Boeing 747, something that's like, polished up and has all, I don't know, miles and miles of wiring and complexities and systems, I feel like what we have now is like a paper airplane because they've just put the shape of something that does something, you can put your penis in it, that's it. Right. I feel like that's the stage you're at. And also between now, between a paper airplane and a Boeing 747, you're going to have a lot of like airplane crashes and lots of crashed biplanes and probably hor horrible repercussions. Right. When you talk about you know, making a meaningful connection, uh, if we look at, say, Japanese society, they've been making meaningful connections with technology for a while uh, through video games and what they have that's led to is very much a, a culture where the kids are just not going out and meeting each other. They've, they've become socially inept. Um, the you know, birth rates have dropped massively. You know, what do you think the sex robots are going to do in terms of that kind of future? Are we going to end up basically just not meeting each other and, uh, and, and propagating? Potentially. I mean, we kind of see, if we just think about modern technology, that already in, uh, affects us and our relationships. You can look at something like Tinder and how that, how that kind of changes the way that people behave with one, one, one another because they're just swiping past kind of in a gamified way, maybe not even being their kind of being a fake self, being not their best self, and it's changed the way that kind of people are almost disposable because they're just this endless stream. So if sex robots come in and initially if they have this female form, I feel like already that is quite dangerous because there's the potential that people are maybe these reclusive people are having sort of a one-sided relationship where they're taught that this robot just does what they want, it just gives them what they want. It doesn't, it's not a two-way process. And I wonder really what that would do to someone if they learn that that's how you interact with something that is humanoid. And so how, how will that change their behavior in the real world as well? I don't know. It's an issue of custom. Actually, I kind of want to take a straw poll out of everyone sitting in the audience. Who would have sex with a robot if I offered it to you today? Yeah, a few hands, not very many. Interesting. Uh, not very many hands. <laughs> Clearly, they're not popular. Not very they? many yeah. hands. Um, yeah. But I, I, think, I think you bring up a really interesting point around intimacy as well. And I'm interested in your take as well, having spoken to people around the kind of mental health aspects. Um, because I think when we, when we talk about sex robots, um, very frequently we talk about it in the media as if it's just weird people fulfilling weird fetishes and weird kinks. But actually, I think they could really play um, an important role in, in a kind of caring sense as well. So you have, for example, a robot called Paro, which is a cuddly, like, 
yeah. seal toy <laughs> that helps old people with dementia. Or you could um, use some kind of robotics for people who have some anxiety, people who are excluded from their community, um, to kind of help them bridge towards more human connection. So in that way, I think robotics can help us kind of reclaim some of our humanity almost. Yeah, it's, uh, and by the way, you mentioned Tinder for robots, actually. Somebody uh, who's calling themselves anonymous in the audience. Uh, I hope that's because they don't want to give their real name and it's not the uh, infamous hacking group. No. Um, <laughs> they're asking, is there a Tinder for robot? Uh, oh. yeah. Actually, I think there's a Tinder for bots, because uh, most of the people that match with me are clearly not real. Um, <laughs> there's a better question here. Uh, do you think we can create robots that humans will really fall in love with? And uh, what are the implications for humankind then? I mean, how do you feel about that, Stephanie? Could we Why really not? fall in love? Um, I think people empathize with uh, their technology at the moment. And actually, that concept of love is, is the one the question that comes up time and time again. And you'll see it explored in like, has anyone seen Westworld? Great TV series. If you haven't seen it, I highly re recommend watching. This love concept always comes up. And I think I don't see a problem with people falling in love with robots. The question is, can the robots fall in love with you too? Can they program right. to do that? Are they conscious? I mean, maybe it's just uh, forever unrequited love with maybe. robots. Mm. I mean, it also brings to my mind the fact that the population, I mean, maybe in some locations they feel like their population's aging. They not have enough. Uh, a high enough birthing rate compared to the rest of the world, so they feel like they're losing out potentially in the future as, as a country. But globally, we are becoming overpopulated, so what if sex robots are some strange, creepy blessing that kind of shifts the way that humans exist on this planet and like reduces our burden on the, on the Earth? What if, what if we strategically launch them in countries where they're needed? <laughs> yeah, in very horny countries. <laughs> very horny countries. Uh, nobody's ever said that in a panel discussion before. You heard it here first. Um, so, you know, what, what is coming next um, as far as, you know, the entire industry is concerned? Because we, we're clearly not uh, at the sex bot stage. So let's talk about some of the products that are available right now and the way that people are interacting with them and, and what's coming next just in the next year or so that might start taking us baby steps along the line to you know, the full bone sex robot experience? Um, it's an interesting one uh, because most of the products that, at least within the kind of sexual accessories space, are actually, most of the products that are coming out at the moment or the, the biggest growth space in the industry is for couples. Um, so I think we'll see more stuff coming out around, around that. Um, I think there's some interesting things happening around, for example, teledildonics. So the idea that you can have sex over distance, some kind of haptic feedback. Um, and that's something that I'm, I'm working on and releasing in, over the next few months. Uh, you'll also start to see, I think, more data-driven uh, smart products. Um, so one of the things that we're really keen to do with our products is um, start to use sensors to understand the body. And once we can understand what turns you on, we can curate a whole bunch of content for you and create a real experience. Um, so it could be your smart lighting, your smart heating, mm -hmm. your Spotify, um, even like sensory in terms of smells is very important. Uh, so I think you'll start to see a lot more data-driven products coming onto the market, um, especially as there is a patent uh, that will run out from the US um, that is to do with any internet-connected sex product. So as soon as that pattern runs out, I think um, kind of middle of next year, you'll start to see a lot more interesting products surfacing. Like the question of uh, perceiving someone's physical state, I find really interesting because if, you, mm. if we got to a stage where technology advanced so much that if we did have a humanoid sex robot in our homes, I think about something like uh, the Microsoft Connect camera that you can use to, it can detect your heart rate through the, the kind of flushing of blood in your face. Is there the potential that in the future we could have robots that are able to perceive so much about us just as we kind of walk into our home, they can kind of tell how your day was and you've, they've probably tapped into your phone, they've seen all your conversations you've sent the entire day, they know if you've had a bad one. They might basically have so much power and so much control over understanding your state that maybe they could be better than a human lover where you kind of 
you're having sex and you're, you, someone miscommunicates and something goes in the wrong hole or something and everything's gone wrong. Like, if the, what if the robot just perfectly knows what you want and just gives you that maximum experience? The best orgasm of your life. Right. And like, where are humans then after that? I don't know. I, I, think, um, I think some people might prefer robot sex. Some people will prefer human sex. There'll be differences and mm. everyone's diverse. So. That's so valid. And it, like, a lot of the discussion in the media is like, the sex robots are coming. They're going to ruin the world. Coming. But, right, <laughs> but essentially, it's not for everyone, is it? We're not saying everyone has to have one. No. No, no. And with all of this as well, you know, I worry about what happens when we've got uh, all of this data. Uh, we have these connected devices like teledildonics, for example. What happens when uh, Anonymous, uh, who's asking all the questions here, uh, goes and hacks into all of the uh, devices around the world. Is, is that a worry? Are we, are we concerned about what happens when people hack into these devices? Yeah, I guess hacking is always a concern. And I, I kind of say that in, these days, nothing is unhackable. So it's all about the contingency that you place around how you store your data, what data you store, um, and the fact that it's anonymized. Um, so even if someone did hack into your data, the most they'd get is a few like squiggly lines and graphs that doesn't really mean anything and isn't connected directly to you. Um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of how you go around the data point. But yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting question. And as products get smarter, I guess the thing is, is that sex is still such a taboo topic. If it wasn't as taboo in society, then we wouldn't be as worried about... I mean, do you, do you care if someone knows that you had a wank last Monday? No. A robot wank or a normal no. one? No. No, personally, like, no. Would you mind? <laughs> I, I guess if, if society is le has less taboos around sex full stop, which I think it will do over time, yeah. then people won't mind as much sharing their data. And the, but the most important thing I always find is that you have to ask for consent. Consent in sex is the most important thing, and it really needs to transfer to sex and technology. You have to make sure you have people's informed, enthusiastic consent to give their data, which is why I'm concerned about things like the digital economy bill in the UK, yes, yeah. which is pretty much going to force you to opt in. Yeah, absolutely. Per, well, everyone. And, and final word on that, Joe? <laughs> I'm just thinking about like an, a regenerated offline world of pornography. <laughs> just nudie mags everywhere, because no longer you have anonymity online. Is that what, did I say that right? Yeah, yeah, it's... Um, That'd be weird. I mean, creating closed loops that aren't linked to the cloud is one way of getting around kind of sharing data. But, um, but yeah, maybe everyone will go back to porn mags. That's maybe it. Well, you heard it here first. We're going to see a resurgence <laughs> in porn mags. Um, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much to James and Stephanie. Uh, it's been wonderful. Please give them a huge round of applause. Thank you.